So as we look at what the Word of God is saying about us, it really blows my mind. When I think about what God says about me, right? It says that I have the mind of Christ. Like the moment I was born again, I was given the mind of Christ. Think about that. I was given the nature of Christ. The nature of Jesus was placed in me. And it says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead was given to me. And if that wasn't enough, Jesus said that I give you the same assignment that I have. What did he say? Truly, truly, I tell you, the same things that I did, you will do in greater things. Because God had a plan for us to continue the works of Jesus on the earth. And the work of Jesus was to destroy the works of the devil. That's why Jesus came. So if that was his plan, what's our plan? We're supposed to be doing the same thing. And, and you look at what the Bible says about that. You look at the instructions that he left his disciples and what his plan was and what we were supposed to be doing. And he uses these phrases a lot, authority and dominion. Now, I grew up in a culture that never, ever, ever, ever talked about authority and dominion. So as I thought about it this week, I realized, I guess what I thought was that all this stuff about authority and dominion was just some kind of a charismatic Pentecostal doctrine. I didn't believe it was even in the Bible because we were never taught it. So is it that? Is it just some Pentecostal charismatic doctrine? Or does the Bible say this? See, and what I learned is I am a disciple of Jesus. You guys are disciples of Jesus, and a disciple above everything else is a learner. So if you want to know what God says, you got to learn it through his word. So what we're going to do is we're going to learn some things about what the Bible says about you, because you and I have to know who we are and what God intended for us to do while we're on the earth. So we're going to learn about some of these things that God planned for us. So we're going to go back to the beginning. Anybody? Bibles open up to Genesis 1. I bet most of you guys do Genesis 1. So we're going to start off at Genesis 1.27, and we're going to allow the Word of God to tell us God's design for us. So Genesis 1.27 through 28 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. So there's that word. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. So who does God say he gave dominion to for the earth? Did he say that he kept it for himself and he's in control of everything? He says he gave dominion to people. We have to understand something very important. The earth was made for man Man was not made for the earth, right? In, in Ephesians, he says that, that he, with us in mind, he made the earth, right? So everything in the earth was made for us. And once he established everything that he intended for us to have, want, need, then he made man. And we came into a place of total abundance. Think about that. What was the first thing that Adam and Eve did when they were, when they were, when they were created? The first day they rested. Why? Because... It was grace. There was nothing for them to do. God had already provided everything they were ever going to need. So the first day was just take a day off, have some fruit, enjoy, right? Because it's grace. It was a picture of grace. But he gives them this, this, this command. He tells them, I've blessed you, right? Bless means divine empowerment to produce, right? To increase and multiply. That's the first thing he did for man. He gave them divine empowerment to increase and multiply. Then he says, to have dominion over the earth. So we have to understand what this word dominion means. So listen to this. Dominion means sovereign or supreme authority, the power to govern and control. That's a problem with most of our theologies because we've been told that God is the one in control and he's the one that's deciding if, when, where, how, everything that happens, he's the one that's telling people what to do. He's controlling everything. He's in heaven micromanaging the earth. That's the theology that most people believe. But is that what this is saying? That's not what this is saying. He says that he gave man authority or the power to govern and control the earth. So God created the earth for man and gave him the authority to govern, rule, 
or control the earth. So now, when you look up this word dominion, it also uses the word authority. So we have to understand what authority means. And authority means delegated power. It means delegated power or exercising power that belongs to another. So one of the challenges that we have is when you start talking about dominion and authority, people think that you're saying that you are God. That's not what I'm saying. That's certainly not what God is saying, right? But what he's saying is, I'm giving you my power. It's going to flow through you. So think about a law enforcement officer. When a law enforcement officer walks into a situation, is it his own power? It's the state, right? If, if, if there's a high patrolman on the side of the road and he walks out in front of your car and goes like that, you don't stop because he can stop your car with his physical strength. You stop because he has a badge. He's carrying the authority of the state. And if you know what's good for you, you're going to stop because he also has some power. It's called a 40 on his side, right? He has power and authority, right? So we have to understand that's what authority means. It is the, 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 the gift to use something that doesn't belong to you. See, when a pastor marries someone, doesn't he say, by the power vested in me by the state of California? It's the authority. When I marry someone, I'm using the authority of California. And that's what God is talking about here, that he has given you authority, but you're using his power. Don't ever think you could do anything in your own power. You can't do anything in your own power. The good news is we don't have to because he gave us access to his. You guys with me so far? So the question is, can we confirm this in other places in Scripture? So that's what I keep trying to help us understand. You cannot take one verse of Scripture and build a doctrine on it if there's other verses that are conflicting with it. That's why we have 6,000 denominations, because we take one verse and we build a whole theology around one verse, and there's five or six verses that are in conflict with that. So let's look at what it says in Psalm 115.16. This is also God speaking. You guys understand that? Every word that you see is God speaking to you. So he says, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Does that confirm me what he said in Genesis 127 and 28? Now, how about this? This is Psalms 8. Yet what honor you have given to men created a little lower, only a little lower than Elohim. Elohim is the plural name of God. God created a little bit lower. Most of them say angel, if you read most translations. But if you look at it in the Greek, it means Elohim. So he's not saying you are. And then it says, crowned with glory and magnificence, you have delegated to them rulership over all you have made with everything under their authority, placing earth itself under the feet of your image bearers. That's three witnesses that are telling us the same thing. So the question is, how did God intend man to release his power? How did God intend man to release his power? Well, Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God, copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children. So what we have to do is look and see how did God release his power? Because however he did it, he wants us to do it. So Hebrews 11.3 says, Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God. God's words. And then he tells us how it happened. He spoke and the universe and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. Right? So it didn't come from nothing. Right? So everything already existed in this invisible realm. You could call it the kingdom of God, whatever you want to call it, but it always existed there. It didn't come from nowhere. And when God spoke, it came from the invisible realm into the physical realm by the power of his faith-filled words. So God said, light be, and light became. He said, fish be, and fish became. He said, birds be, and they became. They already existed 
in another realm that we can't see, and he spoke, and his power was released through his words. That's how God works. That's how he created the earth, is through the power of his words. And then it says that it was all sustained by the word of his power. So we're real concerned about the environment and that we should all be good stewards of the environment. But let me tell you something. When God said light be, it ain't going to change until he changes his words. Because everything is held together by the word of his power. So unless he speaks something differently, we're good. Until he says something differently, we're good. Nothing's going to change with our universe. That was a good place for an amen. You guys missed it. So God released his power through faith-filled words. So now what I want to do, I want us to look and see, can we see God working through people on the earth? Again, because my whole life, I always thought I just prayed and God did whatever he's going to do. And if it didn't happen, it was his will. If it did happen, it was his will. And we were always confused about his will because you just thought whatever happened, case or rock, sera. That was my theology. Case or rock, sera. Whatever will be, will be. But is that what we see in Scripture? So it's not. So what I want to do is I want to start looking at Moses. And I want to show you something really, really powerful. And we're going to walk through this life with Moses. We're going to see this pattern. So in Exodus 3, 9 through 14, so Moses has left Egypt. And now he's in the desert. And he is a shepherd. And he's, he's mending, tending his sheep. And he comes across this burning bush and he has this encounter with God. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel have come to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve the God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me. I am has sent me. So the first thing I want you to understand is when God wanted to accomplish his purpose on the earth, what did he do? He found a man. It's really important to understand that he found a man. Right? He found a man that he could work with that would cooperate with him. So think about this. We know that God is all-powerful. right? We all agree with that. right? God is all-powerful. So if he wanted to, he has the power of words. We know what he could do with the power of words. right? So if he wanted to, he could have just spoke to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And what would have happened? What would have happened if, if he would have said to Pharaoh, let my people go. He would have just fallen down in a puddle, right? And the people of Israel would have just walked and marched right into the promised land. But see, what's the problem with that? For God to do that, he would have violated the covenant he made with man that they had authority. He made a covenant with man that they had authority on the earth. And that would have been a violation of what he did. He says in Psalm 89, 34, my covenant I will not break nor alter the words that come forth from my mouth. So once God makes a covenant with man, he doesn't break his covenants. So he made a covenant that he was going to work through man on the earth. You guys with me so far? Now, I, wanna, I want us to understand some parts about this interaction between Moses and God, because it's really powerful. When God gave Moses the assignment, the first response was for him to feel ill-equipped. And to be honest with you, when God gives you an assignment, you should feel ill-equipped because what he's asking you to do is beyond your natural ability. See, we feel equipped because we don't think supernaturally. When God gives us an assignment, we think that it's just some earthly thing. So we, I got this. 
No, if he asks you to do something, it's supernatural. And you're not going to be able to do it in your own power. You're going to need him, right? So the first response of Moses was, me, right? What? You want to use me? But what I love about this is how God responded to him. See, the human nature thing to do is to prop people up. Hey, you got this, man. Because we have to understand something about Moses. If you look at Egyptian history, do you realize that Moses was an was a army hero? If you read Egyptian history, he won many great battles. The Egyptian army was, a, was the biggest, baddest army of the day. And he was their top general or whatever, whatever you called, whatever the title was. He was a bad dude. Moses was a decorated officer. So in the natural, he would have been perfect for this. But what did God say? I will be with you. In other words, don't worry. You're not going to be doing this. I'll be with you, right? Authority, right? I'll be with you, right? It's not going to be your power. I'm going to be with you and I'm the source. That's what God was telling him. And the, here's the phrase that the Lord spoke to me this week. So God never gives us an assignment that we can accomplish in our own strength. He is supernatural, so his plans are supernatural, and you cannot accomplish supernatural things through natural means. So you might want to highlight that. That's a good word right there. You cannot accomplish supernatural things through natural means. And the last thing that, that God says to him when, when Moses said, who should I say is, is I'm representing? And he said, I am. What does that mean when he said, I am? It means the all-sufficient one. So what God was telling them to tell the children of Israel, whatever you need, I am. Right? I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm Jehovah Rapha. I'm Jehovah all of these promises. I am him. Whatever you need, I am. I'm the unchanging one. And whatever you need, I am. That was supposed to bring great comfort to them. I am. Whatever you need, I am. Now, Exodus 7, I, I read that a bunch of times, and it just I just would pat, just go past it because I just couldn't understand what God was saying, honestly. But listen to this. So God is having this conversation with Moses about his trip to Egypt. And he says this, So the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. And Aaron, your brother, shall be a prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tear Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of this land. So what is God saying to Moses when he says, you're going to be like a God? Is he telling Moses that he is going to be the fourth member of the Trinity? Right? And all of a sudden it's like, hey, we made room for you. Just come on in and join us. No, that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is, I am going to do supernatural things now, and the only person he's going to see is you. The only person he's going to see is you, and he's going to know that these are not natural things, right? These are things that no man can accomplish on his own, so he's going to attribute them to you because you're all he sees. That's what that God is telling Moses, get ready for this, right? Because you're going to do some things that Pharaoh's going to go, Right? He's going to need a V8, right? Because he's not going to believe what God is about to do through Moses. So now, I don't want to read all of this, but, but this will blow your mind. I want you to, you're, we're going to just look at one of them, one of the 10 plagues, but you will see the same pattern through all of them, and you will see how God works. This is so amazing to me. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, I will strike the waters, so he's talking to Moses, which are in the river with the rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die. The river shall stink. And the Egyptians will loathe and drink the water of the river. So the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod, stretch out your hand over the waters of the Egypt, over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, over all the pools of water, that they may become blood, and there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in the buckets, in the wood, in the pitchers of stone, 
And Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river. In the sight of Pharaoh and the sight of the servants and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. So we have to understand. So God tells Moses and Aaron what to say to Pharaoh. And then he tells him what to do. So he tells him what to say. Repeat it with me. What to say and what to do. But here's what you have to understand. When was the power of God released? When Aaron and Moses did what God said and said what he said. The power of God was not released until they obeyed God. That was their authority. That's how they released it. They heard from God. They did what God said. They said what God said. And the power of God was released at their command. And if you look at this story, you will see this with every one of the 10 plagues. God spoke. He told them what to say. When they said what he said and did what he said to do, only then was the power of God released. Why? Because man has the authority on the earth. Quiet in this place. So here's the pattern that you will see all through the Old Testament. God spoke, the people obeyed, and God released his power. So I want us to look at this a little bit more. Faith is like a two, two sides of the same coin. We talked about this a lot. So one side of the, of the, of the coin is belief. And belief is taking God at his word, but faith is acting upon his word. So faith without works is dead, right? So if you believe something, the evidence that you believe it is you do something with it. If you don't do something with it, then you just don't believe it. it's that simple. So they had a choice. Every time God spoke to Aaron and Moses, they had a choice. They were going to believe what he said and do something with it or not. And if they would not have followed God's instructions, you would not see this written in this book. Because God set things in order for how he wanted to accomplish things on the earth. So Psalm 105 is, is David now, and he's retelling what happened in Egypt. And it's a, it's a summation of what happened in Egypt. And I remember I was, I was reading all this, and I'm wrestling with this because this goes against everything I grew up believing, right? This whole thing about God working through people. And then I remember reading this in the living room one time and I was shouting and I woke up Teresa and I'm like, I told you, this is what it says right here. So listen to this. So, but, but he sent his faithful servant Moses, the deliverer, and chose Aaron to accompany him. Listen to this now. Their command brought down signs and wonders working miracles in Egypt. Who's the there there? It's Moses and Aaron. He's saying Moses and Aaron brought down signs and wonders at their command, working miracles in Egypt. Now listen, by God's direction, they spoke and released the plague. So do you see what, what happened? Once God gave authority to man on the earth, he, his plan was to direct men, right? So now he speaks to people and he leads them into what he wants to do. And then if they do it, he releases his power. But he is not the one doing it now. He's working through people. This was his plan from the beginning. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with it. But it's what the word says. It says that he works through people. Let's read that again. Their command brought down signs and wonders working miracles in Egypt. And it tells us how. By God's direction, they spoke. So they heard from God and they used faith-filled words to accomplish what God wanted to do it. And as soon as they spoke their faith-filled words, God's power was released through their faith-filled words. You'll see this all through the Bible. We're going to look at it more. So, one of my favorite parts of this story 
is when they get to the Red Sea, right? So they get to the Red Sea. This is a sea. This is an ocean. This is not a pond. It's not a puddle. It's an ocean. It's a sea. And they're sitting there waiting, and there's mountains on the side. And the people are already murmuring because that's what, just what they do. The whole time, the, the children, they're just murmurers, they're complainers, right? So they're already starting to complain. And Moses is standing, this is just how I see it. Moses is standing there facing them, and Egypt is behind them. And he's, he's, he's addressing them. He's the leader. And he says this, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you. He shall hold, so hold your peace. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. Right? So, so God's having this conversation with them. And this is just how I see it. And as he's addressing them, he sees this little flash of light in the distance. And he looks again, and he sees swords. And he sees chariots coming at him. Right? And now he's giving this like awesome speech. And I was like, he's like, uh-oh. Right? So they start hearing like the thunder, like there was horses coming, like it's noisy. They weren't sneaking up. It wasn't no stealth thing, right? There's an army coming after you and there's chariots and horses and horses are snorting, right? And people are screaming probably because they're coming to, to get back what was theirs. And all of a sudden, Moses seems to change his pitch. Something seems to change because he says, why do you cry out to me? So he's given them this great speech. It's kind of to me, right? It's like William Wallace. You guys ever see Braveheart? And he gives that great speech. This is kind of like Moses is doing. And then it seems like he kind of slips off and he just kind of, Lord, what are you going to do? Because why else would God say, why are you crying out to me? So something happened in Moses' heart where all of a sudden he kind of slipped back into this old way of thinking that God was the one who was going to have to do it. It doesn't tell us that, but something changed or God wouldn't have said that to him. Why are you crying out to me? And what does he say? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it. Now, did it say, lift your hand over the sea and I will divide it? Does God take credit for the power? He said, lift your hand up and divide the sea. So he gave them the command. So if God tells you, go forward, there's power in that word, go forward. Right? Think about Peter on the boat. When when God said, come, when Peter asked, can I walk in the water? He said, come. What was Peter walking on? The word, come. Right? That's all he needed. That was enough. Right? So when, when, when God said, go, there was power to go. And now all Moses had to do was cooperate with what he said. And he said, stretch forth your hand. And when he stretched forth his hand, it was God who released the power, but it was done through Moses. So God must be pretty secure, right? Wouldn't you think? Because he didn't, he didn't say, hey, don't forget, I did that. He tells us, his followers, that it was done through Moses. But here's what we have to understand. Could Moses have done this without God? Was it his own human strength? No. So could he have done it without God? No way. But would God have done it without Moses? No, because he made a covenant with man. That's the part we have to understand. He made a covenant with man that he would work through us. See, John Wesley has this amazing quote. He says, it seems as if without man, no, without God, man can do nothing. But without man, God will do nothing. Because there's this, I just call it divine partnership. That's what's helped me remember it. God created divine partnership where he works through man. We are his image bearers. 
And his plan from the very beginning was that he would work through us. So do you guys see that through Moses? And you will see this if you will, you will never see the Old Testament again after this. You, everything will look different to you. When you see what happened with the wall of Jericho, you'll see it now. God instructed Joshua what to do. And when did it happen? When they shouted, the power of God was released. When they got to this, the, the Jordan River, the power was released when they obeyed. When they did what God said to do, it was released. Because God gave man authority on the earth. I mean, there's one that I, don't, I, I can't wrap my mind about, around it. I'll find out when I get to heaven. But read the story about Joshua. When he, when he commanded the sun to stand still. He just commanded the sun to stand still, and it did. The sun stopped so they could finish this battle. <laughs> okay, awesome, right? He exercised his authority. He believed something, and God said, I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> Gee, I don't know. That's amazing to me. But see, what I want you to see, we're going to look at this more. We're going to look, we're going to look further at the New Testament next week because this is really important for us to understand. But I just want to kind of give you a glimpse. So I want to read the story of the centurion. This, everybody has heard this story a bunch of times, right? Anybody here? We've all read the story of the centurion a bunch of times. So let me just read it and let me kind of give you some backdrop. So this is in the Living Bible translation. When Jesus arrived at Capernaum, a Roman army captain came and pled with him to come to his house and heal his servant boy who was, who was in bed paralyzed and racked with pain. Yes, Jesus said, I will come and heal him. Then the officer said, Sir, I'm not worthy to have you in my home, and it isn't necessary for you to come. If you will only stand here and what? Say, 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 be healed. My servant will get well. And listen to his, what he says. I know because I am under the authority of my superior officer and I have authority over my soldiers. And I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave boy, go this, do this and do that. And he does it. Now listen to this. And I know, Jesus, that you have authority to tell sickness to go and it will go. Now, Jesus said this man had the greatest faith he had ever seen. So I want us to look at this a little bit. I want us to take some time here. We have to understand the backdrop. So, so Rome was the occupying force in all of Palestine. You guys understand that, right? They were the occupying force, right? So, so Caesar sent these groups of soldiers, and their only job was to keep the peace, right? There was no war. The war was over. They were just there to keep the peace, Right, so all throughout Palestine, they had sent these regiments of men, and there were usually, it was a smaller area, there'd be a hundred. So a centurion is a leader over a hundred men. Right, so he's in this area, this region of Galilee, and his whole thing is to keep the peace. Now, what is the one threat of peace? The biggest threat of peace would be a large crowd. Right, if, if somebody was to dress a large crowd and get them all fired up, that could be a problem, right? Well, ask yourself something. Was there anybody in the region of Galilee where this man was that was drawing large crowds? There was a man named Jesus there, and it says great multitudes were coming to him. Now, if you look at the Greek word for multitude, it means at least 10,000 men. And they only counted men. And they were coming to him for one reason. Why were they coming to Jesus? To be healed. Do you think there was ever, ever women that needed to be healed? Do you think there were children that need to be healed? There was thousands of people coming to Jesus at a time, thousands. But how many more is it if you add the word great in front of multitude and put an S on the end? See what I'm saying? This is a crowd. This is like, this could have been 30, 40, thousands upon thousands of people were coming around Jesus. So if you're the centurion and your job is to keep the peace, where are you going to be? Wherever that crowd is, you're going to be there. Now, it doesn't say that in Scripture. I'm just looking at it from a historical standpoint. Like, Caesar was relentless. If you fail, you get a haircut that starts at the neck, right? Failure was not an option, right? So if, if, if there was a crowd, I promise you, the centurion would have been 
watching what the person was saying, he was paying very close attention, right? Because all it takes is a few words to start a riot. So this man would have been close to Jesus and he would have been listening to what he said and watching what he was doing. So we have to ask ourselves, what was Jesus doing? He was opening blind eyes, deaf ears, raising people from the dead, casting out devils. He was doing what God sent him to do. He was, he was destroying the works of the devil. And how was he doing it? Through words. So this centurion is standing here watching Jesus say, blind eyes open. He didn't have to say in the name of Jesus. It's him, right? He just said, eyes open. Rise up and walk. Ears hear. And, and over and thousands of people were coming to Jesus. And he was 100%, right? Everyone who came to Jesus got healed. Not one person ever left not healed with Jesus. And this centurion is just watching this over and over and over again going, what is happening? But he, 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 it finally dawns on him, wait a minute, Caesar is my God. Caesar was the Romans' God. And whatever he said came to pass, right? If he, if he wanted something to happen, he spoke to his officers. And was there an option? Did they tell Caesar, I'll think about it? No, right? If he said something, how high? That's how it worked, right? How high? So these, these officers would tell the enlisted men, if you will, to carry this out. And then what did they do? They said the words and the other people said, oh, that's Caesar. So they didn't look at the centurion and size him up and think, I could probably take him, right? Because I outweigh him by 20 pounds and I got a bigger sword. No, it was the, it was the words of Caesar. Right? They obeyed because of Caesar's word. So this centurion, is that's what he's talking about. The greatest faith that Jesus ever saw was the person who understood authority. He understood that it was the power of words. He understood it was the power of words. And what did he say to Jesus? You don't even have to come. Just say the words, be healed, and it'll be healed. And then he goes through this whole thing about authority because he understood the power of words. He understood that what Jesus was doing, he was not the source. Do you understand? He understood that Jesus wasn't the source of all this power. Jesus is very clear that yes, he was God, but he did what he did as a man empowered by God. He said it over and over again. I only do what I hear my, I only say what I hear my father say and only do what my father says to do because God was the source of power. Jesus was walking in the authority of God. And then before he leaves, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, now you go. And who's he talking to? The church. He's saying, keep going, kids. Get this thing done. None of this stuff you see is from me. You shouldn't tolerate it. I am a God of abundance. And if it's not abundance, get rid of it. That's what he was telling. That's what Jesus, did you figure it out? That's what Jesus was doing. If it wasn't good, it couldn't stay. It had to go because Jesus came to reveal the goodness of God. So he just punted it. It's like blindness, get out of here. You can't live here anymore. So the man with the greatest faith was the person who believed in the power of words. He believed in the authority that was working through Jesus, and he connected it with the authority he had as a Roman soldier. And he says this, I know you have authority to tell sickness to go, and it will go. So I'm just going to touch on this. We're going to talk about it probably next week, but I just want, I want to remind you of this. So, so Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples. And this is shortly before Jesus is arrested. This is one of the last conversations he has with his disciples. And he said to them, I tell you this timeless truth. The person who follows me in faith, believing in me, will do the same mighty miracles that I do, even greater miracles than these, because I go to be with my Father. 
For I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name. And that is how the Son will show what the Father is really like and bring glory to him. Ask me anything in my name and I will do it for you. So one of the last things that Jesus said to his leaders was, I am going to use you to do the same things that I was doing. Because God's plan was to bring the kingdom. The kingdom of God is amazing. This is not it. What we're seeing, what we're experiencing, this is not what God intended for man to experience. The kingdom of God is amazing. And he told his disciples when he sent them out, I gave you authority over every demon and the power to heal every sickness. And then he gave them the assignment to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick to demonstrate that the kingdom had come. The power of God was a demonstration that the kingdom had come. The kingdom of God is the restoration of God's design and intent for man. So Jesus came to destroy everything that came through Adam because none of that was God's design for man. So Jesus did that. He destroyed the works of the devil. Through his atoning power, he took up everything that's keeping us from receiving the abundant life. He did it all. And now he, he empowered the church to continue his work on the earth. So we're going to talk about this more last week, next week. So let's, let me close in prayer. Stood up enough hornets for today. Father, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Father God, that, that you love us enough that you would call us to join in this work that you have for us. Father, I thank you that, that you have such an amazing plan. You love your people so much, God. But you have drafted us to be part of your plan. Father God, I pray that, that there would be clarity and understanding, that there would be some humility. God, it took humility for me to understand what you were saying to me. So Father God, I pray that there would be a humility in the hearts of people, that they would let you be true and every man a liar. That we would humble ourselves and say, okay, if this is what you say, I'm going to agree with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hello there. My name is Jim Nave, and I'm the founder and pastor of Reveal Him Ministries. I just want to thank you for viewing our content. I trust it's been a blessing to you. And I just wanted to take a minute to share the vision we have at Reveal Him Ministries. Our mission is to reveal the goodness of God to the world. And I want to let you know what you could do to help us accomplish our mission. It's very simple for you. If you would subscribe to our channel, that will help us spread the message. If you would hit the notification bell, that will get you the latest content automatically. And maybe most importantly, if you would share these messages with your friends, that would make a huge difference in us accomplishing our goal of reaching the world with the goodness of God. I just want to thank you and say we'll see you next time.